Welcome everyone to this Zoom conversation. I think we can all turn on the videos now. Hi. <laughs> Hi again. So welcome everyone to the Zoom conversation, which is called Loud and Proud Queer Feminist Activism in Kenya, Uganda, South Africa and Nigeria. This conversation takes place as part of a series of events under the name Regain Space, The Future is Now, in which the Africa division of Heinrich Böll Foundation wants to celebrate courageous activists from different contexts who fight for democratic spaces, rights and freedom. My name is Claudia Simons. I am Senior Program Manager at the Africa Division of Heinrich Böll Foundation. For those of you who do not know the foundation, it's the Green Political Foundation based in Germany with offices in more than 30 countries and partner projects in more than 100 countries. And we work in the field of democracy, ecology and very importantly, feminism. I have the honor today to be in conversation with four amazing people. And we have a range of participants from the queer feminist spectrum. But before we start, I just want to give you some logistical hints and remarks so that all of this is going um, smoothly. So we will start this conversation among the panelists and open up for comments and questions by the public later. We will do this through the Q&A section in the Zoom menu that you probably find below, depending on your device. So it's called Q&A. It's not the chat. It's something different. So for the, those people who joined us uh, just now, please write your comments and questions in there. Please remember also to put your name and possibly a description of yourself, you know, what you do, where you're coming from. Um, where you add before you write your question so we know who's speaking. Please be reminded that this Zoom is recorded and it's going to be made public afterwards. So um, depending on whether you want, uh, you know, like afterwards people see the name as well, you can also choose to not do that. Um, but for us, it would be helpful if you know who's speaking. Um, so also, if your question is directed towards someone specific, please indicate so. If you have any technical questions or anything that's not directly directed to the panel, you can also post these. And I have a team of two people who are trying to, you know, like be at your assistance um, with regard to those. Um, so our technical host, Philip, who you cannot see at the moment, and also my colleague Nicola are there for you to um, answer those questions. So as I said, the Zoom is recorded and it's made public afterwards. So you will also have the chance to, you know, like look at it again afterwards, but also to share it um, with all those people who could not join us today. So let's come to our four powerful panelists. I am very, very honored to have all of you here. We've been in contact in digital and analogous, analog, analogous, ways it's like it's it's a word that doesn't exist anymore anyways <laughs> so some of you also have met amongst each other some haven't and i'm very very happy that we have the space today for this conversation so thank you all for being here with us today i will start introducing one after the other but also write directly ask questions to the panelists so bear with us um you know uh, in the first in the first uh, minutes so let's start with yvonne Oruo or ivy you live in nairobi you are a gender non-conforming feminist who uses their background as a trained journalist to advocate for human rights of gender and sexual minorities in africa and i would say and beyond definitely beyond you are currently the operations manager at the Gay and Lesbian Coalition of Kenya, and you are involved in advocacy programs, but also in research on sexual orientation, gender identity and expression that focus on lesbian, bisexual, queer women and gender non-conforming persons and organizations at national, regional and international levels. You have worked and volunteered with a number of LGBTIQ plus led organizations for about nine or 10 years. And together with two other amazing humans, you founded Because Women, written with an X, that's important, a healing justice initiative for lesbians, bisexual and queer women and gender non-conforming people in Kenya. You are also an alumna of the CREA Gender and Sexuality Rights Training and an Outright International United Nations Fellow. I hope I got all of this right. That's yes. 
<laughs> you want. So, what is queer feminism for you, and how does that manifest in the political and social context of your work and life in Kenya and beyond? Thank you so much, Claudia, for introducing me so well. I was like, "Ooh, who's that?" I know. But, <laughs> but thank you. Yeah. So, queer feminism. Queer feminism to me is a feminism that uh, radically challenges patriarchy while centering queer people and queerness. By, uh, by that, I mean a feminism that um, uh, challenges notions of homophobia, biphobia, transphobia uh, within the feminist movement. We challenge imperialism. We are a sex positive uh, feminism. We are a feminism that uh, is body positive and um, raises awareness around uh, people who live with disability. Uh, to me, a, a queer feminism is a feminism that uh, continues to go beyond the textbook definition of what feminism is, because we realize that gender exists in a spectrum and gender is so much more than just male and female or man and woman, uh, like the textbook of feminism continues to be even in 2020. So um, for me is a feminism that continues to radically challenge patriarchy um, through an intersection lens and uh, realizing that this is the way that we actually stand a chance at dismantling uh, patriarchy and uh, realizing liberation for all people. Thank you very much for this very short uh, insight on your vision of feminism. It's really something that's at the core of this conversation, you know, like what are we vision envisioning and how are we creating queer feminism? So let's continue with Sinfuka Janita Vari. You are the executive director of Freedom and Rome Uganda, a lesbian, bisexual and queer diverse persons organization that advocates for the respect, protection and fulfillment of their rights and reinforces feminist culture and narratives. Over the past eight years, you've led the LBQ community by empowering its members and seeking synergies between the LGBTI and feminist movements. Your areas of expertise are organizational leadership, administrative and financial management, human rights advocacy and civic activism. You hold a certificate in non-governmental organizations and civic activism from the Institute of International Education in the US. And you also earned a diploma in telecommunications engineering at the Uganda Institute of Information and Communication Technology. I know that you have a long career of very different expertises behind you and probably also in front of you. So tell us what queer feminism is for you and how does it play out in your political and social context that you work and live in in Uganda? Thank you so much. Uh... Uh, like you said, you, you've said, uh, you've described me well, and I just have a short definition of uh, what queer feminism means in the work that I do and how I understand queer feminism. I will not differ so much from uh, what my colleague uh, has um, sub submitted, but I uh, believe queer feminism is a uh, feminism that um, dismantle patriarchy regardless of uh, of uh, sexual orientation gender identity and uh, feminism queer feminism is inclusive of all women and um, that's what that's that's how it manifests in the work that we do and uh, how we how we we are involved in the general uh, general feminist movement. So we we believe in um, no discrimination regardless of gender identity and sexual orientation, and we bring that to table with other feminist movements, uh, generally within the feminist movement. That's how short I, um, I will define queer feminism. Thank you. Thank you. We will also have the time, of course, to dive deeper into that during the conversation. So let's go on with Sia Ketsi Muketsi, better known under her preferred name, Seo Power, also better fitting. <laughs> you are a the Southern African. Yes, revolutionary woman. 
<laughs> you are a Southern African powerful pro-Black activist and intersectional feminist. You describe yourself as a soft, strong, trailblazing, Black, poor, queer, trans, radical and intersectional rural feminist. You've participated in what was known the Fees Must Fall student movement and a number of other revolutionary practices in South Africa. You currently work for Nalane for reproductive justice and attempt to finish your photo series whilst registering the Seo Kitsi Moketsi Foundation. When you are not stressing out about both African and the world's white and black supremacist, transphobic, capitalist, monopolistic, imperialist, cis heteronormative patriarchs, <laughs> you are reading literature and watching duckies, right? <laughs> Amongst others, from Mama Winnie Madikizela, Bessie Head, Audrey Lord, Marsha P. Johnson, Janet Mark, Dr. T. and Toni Morrison, while gathering your radical imagination regarding about you plant, what you plan to do with the land. Say, oh power, what do you plan with the land? And where does queer feminism come in there? Yeah. I mean, so greetings to all. Um, I mean, queer feminism for me is a fucking shit up. Queer feminism for me is personal and political. It's understanding that feminism is not a construct. It's not a concept. For me, I am feminism. For me, feminism started with my grandmother waking up at 4 a.m. to make sure that everything, the household was running smoothly and still went on to flourish, you know, and still made sure that I went on to primary school looking as beautiful as ever. And still being able to push a wheelbarrow from 4 a.m. until 6 a.m., but still I don't know how my grandmother did it, but she was the epitome of feminism. She embodied feminism for me. Hence, for, for me, feminism is not about a group of persons or a group of women that feels that their feminism is more important. Feminism is a way of life. It's a way of living. It's a way of how African people have always navigated space. It's how we've always, you know, lived amongst ourselves. Feminism is not a construct that came with westernization, with white, you know, privileged, classist, radical, elite white woman, but that we are feminism. I actually believe that feminism was actually stolen from us the same way everything was stolen from us, from banks, from, you know, minerals, from everything, even our hair, right? But for me, feminism is something that speaks to the reality of not just black women, but also black trans women and also those bodies that are never ever seldomly mentioned in spaces such as intersex folks such as trans folks because if the feminism is going to only be centralized around queer um, and, and 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 maybe gay and lesbian identification that we are then further you know like instigating erasure and we've seen how so many of us we internalize erasure differently, but how we use feminism as a scapegoat, as a custodian of erasure. And so for me, being in this space and trying to reimagine and re-centralize myself away from a space that erases and suffocates me is what is feminism. Feminism is a way of healing. It's understanding that you come as you are. It's God, it's mother, it's daughter, it's sisters, it's us, that I am feminism, I am life, and that's just about it. And <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> <Save power. laughs> so last but absolutely not least, we come to Olutime in Adek Beye, who lives in Lagos, but today joins us from Washington, D.C. <laughs> so it's, it's morning where you are at the moment. It is. Thanks for yeah. joining us. You're Thank a Nigerian... You Yes, you're a Nigerian white writer, speaker, and advocate whose work exists at the intersection of social justice, human rights, and inclusion. You work as a keynote speaker. You're also known as a keynote speaker, moderator, and facilitator. And you're very much known for your insightful analysis of issues related to feminism and gender and sexualities, but also, for example, urbanism. Your TED talk at the global TED Global 2017 on urban inclusion, which is called Who Belongs in a City, was selected by lead curator Chris Anderson as one of the 10 most notable TED talks in 2017. So I absolutely uh, recommend everyone to watch that. Mm -hmm. You were also awarded the third Gerald Clark Prize for your essay Mothers and Men. And you have been published online by a wide variety of journalistic development and literary platforms in all kinds of languages. And now you work as a staff writer for the correspondent. 
You're an alumna of the inaugural Writing for Social Justice Workshop, um, organized by AWDF in collaboration with FemRight in Uganda 2014, and the Farafina Trust Creative Writing Workshop in Nigeria in 2015, as well as the Bridge Doc Queer Impact Producers Lab in the US in 2017. So what is queer feminism for you and how does that play out in the political and social context of your writing and your mm. life and your work in Nigeria, but Nigeria and beyond, I need to mm. stress. I have to agree with Theo Power and say that queer feminism is the framework for liberation, right? Um, because as a cisgender woman, I came to feminism thinking that feminism was about women's rights. And then the more time I spent studying and realizing the interconnectedness of the oppressions that we face in this world, whether those oppressions are the result of imperialism, like Yvonne mentioned, or the result of transphobic monopolistic <laughs> patriarchy, <laughs> like this, like I said, um, all of these <laughs> all of these are connected and all of these are linked. And yeah. so for us to imagine that feminism is only about women is such a limiting and limited perspective. Queer feminism provides an expansive framework for understanding how we can access not just rights, but freedom in a world that tries to erase us, in a world that tries to destroy us, in a world that tries to delegitimize our existence. Queer feminism allows us to reclaim space that we have been denied, yes, but also to create space that has not existed before or that has been determined to be impossible to create. Within queer feminism, we become magic makers, right? We can do anything because the rules are made by us. We we take the center and we put it right in the middle of our own lives because we say, you know what? We inherited a system that tried to pretend that we could not exist, but we exist. Therefore, we must be magical. Therefore, we can do anything. And that's what queer feminism is for me. It's like the best type of witchcraft, right? It's like generative. It's, it's healing. It's liberatory. It just provides abundance in a world that pivots on scarcity, in a world that pivots on competition, in a world that pivots on violence and destruction, queer feminism just says there is always more and you can create it. That's what queer feminism is to me. Thank you so much. So during our various conversations, and I need to maybe remind the the participants or the public that is also watching the Zoom conversations after it's going to be recorded, we've had conversations before this space and we talked about a lot of issues um, amongst uh, ourselves. So during these various conversations we've already had, um, I extracted a number of common subjects that I felt are seem to be relevant in all our contexts, so it seemed to be really cross-cutting. One of these is the fine balance between visibility and survival. I mean, we call this series or we call this season of our Regain series loud and proud because all of you are very visible. You're very powerfully outspoken queer people. So you are visible, you know, like in, in, in on the street, you're visible in social media and your work and your politics. You're really out there with your gender, your bodies, your politics. And that's despite often very repressive context, be they social or political or legal. So how do you balance that visibility as activists or writers with your own life and survival? And what are your thoughts on that concerning the question of a larger queer community? And maybe you can really add a little bit of context to those people who joined us from um, where your, you know, like where your work is is located in. So I don't know, Yvonne, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, this conversation about visibility versus safety has been an ongoing conversation, even in the Kenyan context when it comes to queer issues and queer organizing and queer feminism in general. And it's a very thin balance between uh, people saying you don't exist and being erased uh, completely and you taking up space and saying we are here and this is what we're about and we're imagining a future where we are liberated and we are free. So it's a very like thin balance. And for me to be out and proud and vocal and very visible 
even in my poverty and in my Africanness and in all of this, I still have some privileges that allow me to do that. I still have protections. I still have a bit of uh, uh, a bit of a class privilege that ensures that my life is not constantly threatened. That does not mean that I, I safely exist in Nairobi and live in this utopian queer paradise. But what it means is that compared to other people, I at times am able to uh, acquire a safety and I'm able to be in spaces where um, my the threat to my existence is not uh, is not very like it's not like a very daily a very hourly a very continuous thing for me and that is why i feel like that is why i step up that is why i do what i do that is why i i am able to walk in the streets the way i am because i know i have a home where i can go and lock the door and be safe and that's not the reality for many people so when i talk to younger queers for example i'm, I'm just like just because you see other people do it does not mean uh, it's for everyone and even the shaming of people who are not able to be out and proud and vocal about the work that they do or um, their identities is something that as a, as a movement we are starting to unlearn and we're starting to unpack all of these things around what, what does it really mean to be visible and is it necessary for, for every, every queer person to be out and proud and, and, and to do the work you get so yeah that is where we are at uh, as a movement and that is where i am as a person and as an activist when it comes to visibility and <coughs> and taking up space as a queer feminist oh my goodness can i just jump on that really I was <laughs> you, right? i'll be after you <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> because i feel like we have taken this script and it makes sense because so much of our blueprint for queer organizing on the continent comes from the West and specifically the US and specifically yes. Stonewall yeah. and you know the gaze of Greenwich Village of, and Christopher Street and mm -hmm. it makes sense for us to imagine that because they achieved certain levels of freedom in that way that we must also adopt these models but the thing is they achieve freedom in the way that worked for them. Yes. It is, to my mind, serving the same purpose of the system that is trying to kill us. If we, mm -hmm. we demand that every queer person be out and be visible and be immediately recognizable as queer, if what it means is that it will cost them their lives. If queer people are going to end up dead because they're visible, mm -hmm. then why are we demanding that they be visible? Mm -hmm how are we different from the straights who want to kill them? Mm -hmm. Our lives matter more than, our, than the ability of straight people to see us for who we are. Our lives are bigger than straight people being able to yeah. comprehend us. We don't exist to be legible to people who believe that we don't even exist. You know, it's like, no, yeah. we exist to be alive. We exist to yeah. prosper. We exist to thrive. We exist to find flourish. love and find healing and find wholeness and flourish. And so if visibility is the way that you access that, then great. But if there are other means for you to access that, then girl, I am living for it. Let me tell you real quick. Um, I just discovered a, a framework that exists in Nigeria. Um, we call it the Oyimbo Wives Co Coalition. And it's a whole bunch of, of queer women who marry expatriates who come to Nigeria to work in the oil industry, knowing that their husbands will be away most of the time, knowing that their husbands are not that invested in the marriage to begin with. And then they take that money that their husbands give them and they make sure they use it to fund their lifestyle with their girlfriends. And I'm just like, I'm here for that. I'm here for that. I'm moving to Look at that. Look at that. You, you found love. You have economic safety. You have a home. Yeah. You have your kids. Yeah. And your girlfriend yeah. lives in your house with you. Girl, yes. Leadership. Look, it's coming out. <laughs> you understand? Who, who cares if you come out or not? You have a whole life. And I know that there are limitations to this. And I know that obviously people are grappling with all the ways that they can survive. And nothing mm. is perfect. But the thing is, people have so many ways of surviving why do we insist on visibility as the only one because we don't mm. talk about how visibility is made possible or made easier when you also have mobility 
Yes. I was listening to Yvonne and thinking about how she talks about access that she has to these spaces. And for so many people, being mm -hmm. queer means being denied yeah. the option of moving through the world. But if you're a queer person who has the option of moving through the world, who has the option of networks outside of the repressive context in which you live, then you have possibilities that are available to you that may not be available to other people. I'm able to be out and proud and loud and whatever because last, last, if, look at me. I was telling you guys earlier that, look, I'm trying to get out of Nigeria. And I have that option, but not every, so why would I sit here and be self-righteous and be like, oh yeah, you have to come out because if you don't come out, you are the one that is holding the gaze back. It's a less not... activist or less queer. <laughs> yeah. Can we not? Mm. Mm -hmm. I, I really want to jump onto that, like just to allude both of you guys' points, which are incredibly important. I also want to touch on selective privilege, right? As to how we know that systematically we are constantly disempowered, that we don't have any form of privilege. But also I think it's important that we start having conversations as to how do we hold ourselves to account as individuals and as a collective by acknowledging that if you are an activist, you somehow have selective privilege. Yes, I do acknowledge that I don't have privilege of accessing hormones in time. I don't have the privilege of graduating in record time. I know I can't just go to any home affairs and access my identity documentation in record time, right? But I, what I also acknowledge is being able to have this conversation right now in real time, post COVID democratic Southern Africa. Whilst I know someone in Bukonubu Pirima, which is the North is colonially known as North province won't have this privilege of watching this you know I, I i i honestly wish that this space would be so encapsulating of people that are generally they, that are generally need needing to be in this space because we know that people in the rural don't have the privilege of Wi-Fi. We don't. We know people in the privileged in the rural areas don't even have the you know the the, the capacity of language, a reimagination of language that reimagines them as safety and as secure. So when it comes to politics of visibility, I mean, as much as I'm, I'm I, I always say that I'm very visible, but I also need to acknowledge that being a black, you know, rural, poor, powerful trans woman within this space these titles that I, I label myself as has brought so much violence onto me. 70% of that work is like constant violence and 30% is visibility. So like for me, how do I then navigate that space without without erasing myself? Because I, like I said earlier on, with me being a, a black trans woman, um, when I'm around white people, specifically white trans women, I feel inferior. And when I'm around black people, specifically black trans women and black queer people, I feel superior. So then when do I exist? When do I, you know, when do I draw the line or when, or maybe when do I not know when to draw the line in this regard? Because we've been set, we've been programmed to know where to draw the line. When someone, when someone calls you of your dead name, you are a tech, you know, when somebody calls you of mis you know, misgenders you, you are tech. When do we go, when are we going to recreate a language that reinforces love, re-centralizes love and healing as, as, as a way of healing? Because I mean, guys, when we talk about, what is this? They said visibility and survivability. Wow. I'm constantly being reminded that I live on borrowed time is something that is always like reminding me that I don't have the privilege of doing this every day. As long as I'm more worried where my maze, where my food is going to come from, then I, I cannot be doing this because my mental health is constantly reminded that I am living on borrowed time. My survivability politics are questionable. My survivability lifespan is questionable. That I can't just, yes, I do have privilege, yes. Even being able to speak this colonial language, which is fucky, which is disgusting, but just being able to like be, <laughs> to express myself this well. Um, and also knowing that I dismantle and fuck shit up because white monopoly capital and supremacy and white people just generally have just put it out there to like erase us, but being able to use that language to also be able to express what my people are feeling on the ground is revolutionary, it's powerful, but also not forgetting that safety and securitization politics is something that I'm always worried about that tomorrow I might die. I might not come back or as I'm walking out of this door, I'm always worried guys, I'm always worried, am I going to come back as a person? Am I going to come back as a person that you see right now with a wig on with beautiful makeup or am I going to come back as a corpse? Am I going to come back bloody? Am I even going to return? Or am I just going to be burnt and be left for the dead? What is visibility and survivability for me, guys? 
what does it look like is it even a language i don't know so um jenny did you want to yes you? just uh, just uh, i just want to share a brief uh, about um, visibility vis-a-vis -vis, uh, safety we've just had a conversation with my uh, with the my staff members about uh, the outed um, former wife to the pastor in Uganda who moved to Canada and got married to a woman. We were like, oops, what are we forgetting? We are forgetting to remind members of the organization that much as you see Biggie making a lot of noise somewhere, I have limitations on my movements, even with the privilege of having a house and also the privilege of speaking that language, the English, that's a privilege to me because they are yes. so can't speak that mm. language, you know. And mm. then, um, for the same, like uh, she mentioned, that there are so many people. There are so many people who would love to listen to us speak or uh, engage in this kind of conversation, but they don't have a privilege. Reminding our members that safety is paramount. Are you worried? Mm. Are you going to come back alive? Mm. And it is so confusing that the people you might think uh, are okay with who you are might be the ones who are going to harm you. So for me, mm. much as I'm out there, I'm always worried about myself. I'm always conscious on how I do everything. And I so I always remind members and LGBT community here that remember a, a very a good activist is that one who is still alive. But if you're dead, then you won't be able to, to accomplish whatever you dream, dreamed, dreamt of doing. So that's all I had to say, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, it really feels like uh, when we talk about queer activism, mostly, you know, like in this North-South divide in the sense of like, you know, like what type of organizations are visible, what type of organizations will get in, make it into the media, make it on panels, whatever. It's it's There, there seems to be this idea of uh, it's just, you know, like it's activism that just is just self-explaining, but there's people behind who struggle for survival within these movements and then there's this whole bunch of people who are not visible but who are there and who are not just those who you know like others are fighting for but they're having their own fights um so so another subject that i felt was cross-cutting in all our contexts and spaces um and it's 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 pretty much related i guess is this question of inclusion exclusion and struggles within queer communities but also with alliances you know like yeah. talking about uh, activism, what, what is the image of activism and how does, you know, like funding come in and, and like also in the, not only in the North South divide, but in general. Um, so we are all fighting, you know, like capitalist, cis heteronormative patriarchal systems, but there's fights that are going on amongst communities within communities and uh, in the process of alliance building. So you've already mentioned some, you know, gender and race privilege plays a role, class and status plays a role, desirability is a big issue, you know, like visibility in the sense of like who is considered queer, who is not considered queer, and how does that play out also in, you know, like lookism. Um, mm -hmm. So what are your experiences in this regard and where do you see or do you see ways to overcome those exclusions and build alliances across privileges in order to foster a queer feminist? You know, activism or movement. Who? Yeah. So, do you want to? I mean, I think maybe it's also important that we also unpack as to what inclusion and exclusionary, um, exclusion culture looks like for us individually, because um, what we know for a fact is that we have a lot of queer, you know, erasure, and then we have trans erasure, and then we just have like generic, like general erasure of black people right but i think also it's extremely important that we understand how as individuals specifically within the queer community how we internalize erasure and further internalize different kinds of homophobia and transphobia onto various identities within the space right i mean for me as a black trans woman specifically within the, the perimeters of southern africa i've ex experienced a lot of erasure from my very own people people that i've known for a fact that i've taken a bullet for but 
whilst I know that whilst I've done that, they'll never ever take a bullet for me. So understanding that whenever they see me, they see me as a wholesome meat. They see me very beautiful, very put together, but then they never get to ask me, how do I do it? Instead of asking me, they'd rather just on to further erase me and just and you know like it's so funny how someone would find you i always make this a typical example that uh people will find you as a beautiful drumstick very whole and then they start nibbling on you and then wait and then the next thing you you check at that bone you are just left with no meat but a bone and on top of that, whilst you tell people to stop, people won't stop, they will still continuously chow on you, chew on you. And when you tell them to stop, what do they do? They spit you out on the ground and then they step up onto you. So that is erasure. That is the kind of internalizing, um, internalized transphobia that I'm constantly faced with, that I'm constantly reminded that as I, as I speak of black trans woman it's the very same black trans woman who are ivy league who are in positions of power um who would never even have this conversation with someone who's trans ordinary like me what are, what does that mean what does that what does that say and the very same people black cis gay men black cis woman you know um black lesbian woman who are constantly telling me that i'm not prone to existence because my body is really not of anything but just a spectacle. So then how then do I navigate that? What does inclusion means whilst inclusion has become my home? I mean, exclusion has become my home. What does inclusion mean? Do we even have inclusion, inclusionary spaces whilst we have not even begun conversations of self-healing, of self-spacing, of self-freedom? What does that even look like? Is that even a context? Is that even a conversation? How do we hold each other to account as first as humans, as individuals before our queerness? And how do we hold each other by making sure that we don't further create segregation within the camp? But we further understand that by holding each other to his account, it's not because we hate each other, but it's because we want to unlearn and relearn new ways of survivability, new ways of loving and healing each other, right? And that's the problem. We just don't want to be held to account because there are certain bodies that feels more feministy, more activisty, and more privileged than the other. Who wants to react on that? Yes. yes to all that yes to all yeah. that i think oh yvonne wanted to go i just yeah, i just want to add really quickly that um the, the comment that you made about calling one another out is not because we hate each other mm. i think that's the thing that gets lost so often um mm. because so especially in activist spaces because so many of us come to activism because we believe in our own inherent goodness right we Shut believe up. in our own inherent commitment to decency and our own, we're, we're good people so when yes. somebody comes and says eh yeah but you fucked up x y and z thing then it's like what do you mean i'm a good person it's like yes no. <laughs> <laughs> nobody's talking about whether or not you're a good person we're talking mm. about creating new ways of being no matter how good you are in this world it cannot be good enough for the world that we're making. So how do you close that gap? It's mm. through accountability. It's through transformation. But the work of transformation is so demanding because it's so inward. And not enough of us have the tools or the safety. And I mean safety not in the sense of the world being a threat, but I mean like in interpersonal relations, in community. We don't have that relational safety that allows us to confront ourselves and confront how the indoctrination has not fully left us or, or mm. how our socialization has not fully left us. We mm. need to transform our relationships to one another by thinking about how these paradigms of scarcity and violence and domination shape everything, everything. Even in activist spaces, you see NGOs that are working for the rights of LGBTQ people fighting for resources because they're still operating within this system of scarcity so people who have the same agenda allegedly end up turning on one another because they're competing for funding and competing for grants and then all of a sudden we're replicating these same models or we create um organizations that replicate the erasure that we're fighting so you have people saying things like well you know we only focus on cisgender issues because we can't do trans activism because x y and z thing and it's like so the future that we're moving towards are we leaving our trans siblings behind are we leaving our non-binary siblings behind are we trying to incorporate cisgender queerness into the existing system or are we trying to dismantle the system 
these are questions that we have to ask ourselves and it's not about whether or not we're good people or whether or not we have mm. good intentions because if we're saying we want a new world then we have to learn new ways of relating new ways of being in community that do not depend on the things that we have been taught are necessary for our survival we have to imagine bigger and better shout out so revolutionary <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to add something about, uh, I think it's Theo who, who mentioned something about working collectively or something um, along those lines. And I wanted to give an example of Kenya. We have this thing about patriotism in Kenya and we all uh, the politicians are always calling for national unity and cohesion. Yeah. It's like an anthem here. Like every time the government fucks up or, oh, I'm sorry, like does something wrong or like people are dying somewhere and there's an uproar and there's protests or like we have a lot of like tribal wars and stuff like that. Mm. The first thing they'll say is national unity and cohesion. And it's something mm. that like, isn't the queer culture like we picked up on. Yeah. And we're, we're mm. always like trying so hard um, you'll hear like in the beginning, like when the movement in Kenya started, when it was super young, it was only like, run, uh, it was run by gay men, like gay men led all the, uh, held all the positions, gay men were the visible ones, gay men, like mm. if you ask anyone about the Kenyan movement, they had like five gay men to like uh, slap you with. So when LBQ women and gender and conforming and trans people started coming up, uh, the one thing that we kept being slapped with was cohesion. They're like, we have to stand together to fight, to fight these people, right? So they're like, they're like, let's just wait first. Like, let's finish fighting, and then we'll come back to the LBQ issues. Let's finish fighting, and then we'll we'll come back to the trans issues. And this is ten years later. Trans people are dying. LBQ women are still being treated horribly in yeah. this country. Yeah. There's the sexism and misogyny even within the queer movement. Yeah. And for a long time we were being silenced to that whole let's work together, let's 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 have unity. It's the only way to fight oppression. And at times, honestly, I feel like it's okay for people to move out. It's okay for trans people to be like, we don't want a part of this thing anymore. And we're organizing yeah. separately in a way that we feel is right is, is right for uh for our people Shut and up. then we can come together like when we are doing uh, national things like for example litigation or like things that require all of us we can sit at the table but like organizing i feel like it's okay for people to just branch out and do their own organizing in their own terms without having to be forced to sit in a place that continues to be violent in the name mm. of collaboration and unity and national and cohesion and what I, I honestly I've gotten to a place in my activism and I'm just like it's fine you guys let us go let people go like let people just have mm. their own terms uh, around how they want to activate yeah, yeah thank you. I, um, just I a can... second say can you can you mute yourself because I think there's some background noise oh Have sorry you, no worries just thank you okay um, when we talk about inclusion, my God, it makes me sometimes, um, so that's one of the things that the word that uh, one time made me think of quitting, you know, like Yvonne said, we talk about inclusion, but where is that queer woman in the fight against HIV? I always speak about that. In Uganda, in Uganda, in the Ugandan community, we were even excluded by our own within the LGBT in the fight against HIV. And yet we have L lesbians living with HIV. We have bisexuals living with HIV. We have trans uh, men and women living with HIV. But there was exclusion of uh, LBQs, but there was inclusion of only trans men, trans women, but not trans men. We have fought, we have fought this battle to be part of the HIV fight until, yes, we are included with reservations, but at least we are there and we have our members um, given information. We have our members in spaces. We remind, we continue to remind our communities that 
especially LBQ women, that we are there who are living with HIV. Stop excluding us in the national HIV national program. They have been calling us a lot of, um, there are a lot of statements coming around. I'm sorry, electricity has just disappeared from <laughs> my office, but I'm still, I, I can still, you can still uh, hear what I'm saying and I can run for the entire period of time. So for me, exclusion, even within the women's space, it was until uh, the, 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 the resilient cashers refused to leave uh, women feminist forum spaces and attended and women, so many women disappeared from this space because of this uh, person, this, this uh, lesbian in space. But after years, it paid. And so we are always included in some way or another. But I've seen a lot of inclusion and I will concur with you, um, uh, um, Ivy, for people moving away, if you feel this space is toxic or is not, is not catering for your issues or not looking at your issues, you can organize. Like for us in Uganda, we have LBQ women organizing. Uh, trans men who feel comfortable being part of a, a, a feminist organization, a women's rights uh, feminist organization, will stay in that space. And trans men who feel it's, un, it's not the space they want to be in, organize. It's very good. Uh, trans women organize also. Uh, gay men organize. Men who have sex with men organize. So that, and, and at the end of the day, if we have a national issue like litigation, we all come together and support each other. We are inclusive of each other, but the organizing, we can do it separate. It is very okay. And I see it working. I see it working. But also uh, there are spaces that we have to push to include uh, our sisters. For example, in the feminist uh, spaces, um, so many have a challenge with the inclusion of trans women. And that mm. will take us to speak about that, to include trans women. And for me, there's a time I, I, I chopped a wire seriously when, when everyone was quiet, the LGBT acronym. Everyone was present, but everyone was quiet when the project that was introduced had no lesbians, in inclusion of lesbians. So I just chopped away and reminded them, you speak for me, I will speak for you. You know, that is, that is kind of, uh, uh, it, it worked, but that is the exclusion, inclusion, you know. It's, I don't know, but I, I, I believe each, each, each acronym can organize separate and then we can work together as an entire community. Maybe that's a, it's a good point to talk about um, your individual and, uh, you know, within your community's ways of actually mobilizing and working, because we've heard a lot that, you know, like maybe we need different spaces, spaces where people can, can come back to where they feel safe in the sense of also like within a community, then spaces where we can come together uh, across, you know, like you know, different genders across different privileges uh, to organize. So maybe you can just give us some ideas about like the ways you work. Uh, I know that some of you consider themselves activists uh, in a very, you know, like uh, um, in a very powerful sense. Others of you would rather say I'm a writer. My work is, you know, like the, 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 I'm, I'm mobilizing across like, you know, like uh, uh, through my writing. So can you maybe say something about that each of you to give us a little bit of the idea of like, how do you organize? How do you mobilize? And, and uh, you know, like, how does that also, uh, how is that referred to the context in which you are, are acting and, and working and living? Ulutimein, do you want to start? Wow. Um, so for me, it's the question of organizing has been very difficult. First, because I don't consider myself an organizer, but also because I don't, because of the way organizing works in Nigeria, the queer organizing space is very separate from the feminist organizing space. It's like what Janita was saying. Um, so the separate organizing works, but then the question of coming together never happens, right? Because there is within the feminist community, the idea that queer issues are either it's one of three things they're divisive they're irrelevant or 
queer people don't even exist <laughs> right it's like yeah, yeah like so the, the question of it's like okay yeah we can come together but first it's divisive so wait let's let's address this our own and then we'll come to you later or it's like we don't need to bring up the concerns of queer people in this conversation because it's not relevant to the conversation or then they'll be like especially like Janice was saying in relation to trans women are trans women real so this this sort of the separateness never lends itself towards any collaborative organizing and so being somebody who does not separate my queer organizing from my feminist organizing it means that there is no space for me to actually exist within either movement because rightfully queer organizers are like you know what the feminists don't care about us we're going to focus on our issues so it's very much focused on public health concerns or state violence so it's either the queer rights organizations are addressing hiv or they're addressing extortion and police brutality but rarely does it um ex ex extending to conversations about how patriarchal socialization is affecting queer lives so there's no it feels like there is no coming together and that's why it, that's a big part of why i've i've sort of step back from the idea of being an organizer and I just write and I'm like you know what I feel like these ideas need to be seeded in the first place and so I have taken that as my responsibility to see these ideas and to defend these ideas and to flesh out these ideas and to normalize them because I understand that with the visibility and the reach and the platform that I have I also have credibility which means that there are things that I can say that might change someone's mind or shift someone's perspective and there are things that I can resist or reject that will do the same work and so that is the thing that I have taken as my responsibility I have seen that there is not enough space in Nigeria for queer feminist thoughts to flourish and so I do the work through my writing of trying to expand to create and expand that space um, and that so I don't I don't think of myself as an activist because that's not the work that I feel is necessary for me to do. And it wouldn't be rewarding work for me to attempt to do in Nigeria anyway, because <laughs> well, we have a long way to go. First, we have to create that space. And so that's what I try to do with my writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can share with how we organize in Uganda, um, which is a bit uh, different because um, for us, we organize uh, closely with the fem feminist space and uh, um, women's rights organization. You see that clearly when we uh, defeated the, the anti-homosexuality bill, um, it was because of the support from the, um, from the, uh, the, uh, the women's spaces. We managed to get documents, things that we used during that period of time, lobbying and reaching to people through those feminists. Even when we are fight, when we are when we are speaking SRA, HRA, as in like um, abortion rights, uh, we work closely. They involve even the LBQ women because um, you're a woman before you you're, you're lesbian, and for us, we work closely with the women's, um, women's uh, rights organizations. They are supportive in so many ways. And we've seen um, of late, there's a lot of inclusion of trans women in uh, women's rights spaces. Even in the spaces where we talk about abortion, trans women are inclusive. Um, yeah, in Uganda, uh, we work closely with the feminist organizations. And it's working for us because sometimes we don't need to speak. They need to speak for us. And then, uh, or they provide platform for us to speak to uh, the hard to reach or the people in authorities. Yeah. Um, I'll jump in and just like uh, talk a bit about the Kenyan perspective. And uh, I feel like here, um, the, the feminist movement, like the, I think it's a generational gap completely, like the older feminists, like the people who came before us, who went to Beijing and, and, and that crop of feminists, like 
were completely immersed in like the women's rights and women, uh, women's, uh, the gender, con women's liberation rights movement completely. And I feel like the feminists or the queer feminist um, radical a part of them must have died. But we have like a, a younger uh, crop of like feminist organizers in Kenya who are amazing. Like Generation Z continues to give me hope. Like they continue to make me believe that we could actually achieve some of these things in our lifetimes. Like at times when I'm hopeless, I just go on Twitter <laughs> and see like the kids got it. So in that sense, I feel like um, the younger feminist organizing is very radical and very queer centered and very queer led even like majority of the young people leading this movement now are queer people but the way we organize um we've managed to collaborate with a lot of mainstream organization and i put mainstream in air quotes because who decides who is mainstream and who is not but like people who get more funding and are more visible and are working on issues that the un like so we've we've uh, blackmailed we have bullied them we have been, like we've used <laughs> every type of intervention intervention necessary to make them realize that uh, queer or lgbtq plus rights are human rights so Right now, I can say for a fact that we have a good number of civil society organizations in Kenya that are mainstream that focus on the liberation of queer people. Of course, this comes with like baggage of heteronormativity, of trying to erase you, of trying to like just uh, rubber stamp and having to tokenize queerness. But we've, we've made leaps, we've made steps where they come to court with us. Uh, they are part of the, um, uh, the people who submit uh, recommendations to the, to the judge. They provided evidence and documentation. They speak on our behalf at times when we can't, although they say, like we tell them what to say, we write the sentence, they're like, read here. But, but like, we've seen a shift. There's been a shift from like five years ago to now you can come to a, a, an LGBTQ plus meeting and find like mainstream organization being present and being active and doing at least their part. Long way to go, but I have to give them credit where it's due. I mean, just to allude to your point, for me, I have just, you know, divorced myself completely from a queer organization or queer organizing because while wow, this space is the most violent and I need to be very honest about my experiences as a black trans woman. Like these spaces are the first spaces to really remind me that I'm not woman enough, that I'm not trans enough, that I'm not feminist enough, that I'm too angry, that I'm trying to be a woman, but actually I am a man. So then why would I be, you know, inserting myself in spaces that have deemed me as a man, that have deemed me as, you know, um, as, as a scavenger, as, some, as something that is not allowed to be in the space, as I've been denounced an object, not as a person or not as a human being or not as anything, but as, a, as an object. So then I think also that is an entire conversation as to why people choose to stay away, you know, when, when, when shit hits the fan because people are tired. Like my tired is tired of constantly having to tell people that include me in your narratives, include me in your space. So I'd rather just go and find and reimagine my own space and what that space looks like for me individually. Because when you start organizing for a group of people, it is said that you are mooring or you are chowing people's funds. It is said that you are being, you are using people's bodies to navigate space. It is never about you. It's always about people speaking ill things about you. And we've seen how South African organizing has put people's body um, through dangerous, you know, through, through dangerous spaces because when you speak up, it says that you're too loud. When you don't, it says that you're too quiet, you're too silent. So when then do we speak up? Because speaking up could mean death for me. Understanding that I live on borrowed time, understanding that, you know, I can't be away. Sometimes maybe a lack of a better word is wasting my time on, on people that will never ever take a bullet for me, will never put their bodies on the line for me. And understanding that, you know, yes, I mean, 
Black rural trans women are continuously facing various, you know, crimes. If it's not gender-based violence, it's domestic violence. If it's not that, it's sexual violence. When are we going to begin having such conversations? If all we're going to be having is how we're going to be, you know, um, making money from a white monopolistic system that we know has constantly erased us. That's why earlier on I say that, can feminism be personal and political? Can we be selfishly deliberate as to what feminism needs to look like right now in real time post COVID democratic southern african politics can we start reimagining you know um, and you know a, a narrative that reshifts the understanding of how we've always underst understood feminism or queer organizing queer organizing has always been about people drafting proposals and submitting it to the higher power you know the higher power being your monopolists and capitalists gone are the days why can't these you know why can't these are uh, monopolies why can't these finance and donors give us the money and then we will tell them what we are going to do with the money and not be told what to do with the money. People are dying every day. Black trans women are dying. Black lesbian women are dying. Black cis women are dying. Black people are dying. And here we are talking about queer organizing whilst someone in Nigeria is being murdered right now, whilst every 30 seconds a black woman is being raped, whilst every 50 seconds a black trans woman is raped, burned and left for the dead. I can't be having conversations about queer organizing. I don't have time for queer organizing. What I have time is for my people. I can't be having conversations of this magnitude at this time in real life about how to go about making money from the system that we know hates us. Instead, let us be having radical, honest, transparent, accountable co conversation that seeks to reimagine us as a people, as individuals, as a collective. Because we know that this, 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 this queer organization has killed so many people, has erased so many people. So even when we try to hold ourselves to account or others, it's, it gets exhausting to a point that you find yourself burning. And whilst you burn out, there's no one to rescue you. So, can we rather reshift and reimagine how that narrative is now going to look like? Hence, why we were saying that, um, you know, they, they appreciate what is happening, how the shift of narrative is now happening, especially within the, the young queer organizers, as to how Olu now believes that I need to be intersected within the space, I need to be included in the space. The same way San Fuka says that we need to create space in that does not just speak of, 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 of feminist or activism, but a space that speaks of healing, of love. Maybe if we reimagine activism from a place of love and continuous healing, then we might have something. Not always, you know, starting conversations around, oh, how are you, so how much money do you have? Um, so how are you surviving? The question that we should be asking is, how's your heart? You know, how uh, have you eaten today? Have you taken your meds? Can you afford your meds? If you're not, if not, how can I show up for you? You know, creating, um, creating a language that we hold each other to account as individuals, because we know some of us in this panel right now are probably millionaires and billionaires, but then they won't give that money because you're not trans enough or you're not queer enough or you're not a cis woman. So how do we then hold those funders and donors to account? How do we make sure that queer women go to school and complete that education in record time? How do we make sure that black trans women as continuously um, um, are, you know, graduate and do not have to drop out, do not have to be you know, victims of HIV and AIDS and cancer? We have not even begun conversations around how cancer is killing black trans women. We have not even begun conversations as to how HIV continuously kills black women. When are we going to have this conversation when every one in nine rape case, when it's reported, only 7% of that case gets to be prosecuted. And we do know that when prosecution comes into place, it's not trans women's cases that are being prosecuted. It's cis women's cases that are being prosecuted. So then how then do I go to a police station and report my case without being misgendered, without being clocked, without being remanded, remanded that I'm a man and being asked that, what were you wearing that day? Can we start having conversations of accountability? I don't want to be having conversations of queer organizing because I right now as I'm speaking, I only have 9 rand 80 cent in my bank account. Is that me not dying? I live on borrowed time. I might die, meaning that I might die without a cent. I cannot perpetuate the same narrative that Black women have always been known as. You know, the likes of Abu Brenda Faisal, who have worked enormously hard, immensely hard, but they died with focal, they died with nothing. I cannot be having this conversation and stress it enough as to how, you know, the system needs to employ Black trans women, the system needs to employ Black queer women, the system needs to employ Black queer people. Heteronormativ heteronormativity is killing us every day. 
What's happening in Nigeria is heteronormativeness. What's happening in Congo, it's heteronormativeness. What's happening in South Africa right now, it's heteronormativeness. What's happening in Nairobi, it's heteronormativeness. What's happening in Uganda, it's heteronormativeness. So understanding, then how do we then go about dismantling these systems? I'm not here if you're not here for me. I'm here for my people. And my people are dying every day. Right now, as we speak, someone is being killed because they don't have the capacity, they don't have the privilege, they don't have the resources. So I think maybe questions needs to be re-strategized or maybe re me reconfigured as to how then do we now start reimagining a language that encapsulates of love as, 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 as a point of departure. Yeah. Does any one of you want to react to that directly? Ivan or what do you mean? Janita, okay. Wow, 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 I just, where to begin because the questions when you when you reframe the conversation in that way then the urgency of the work and the sort of triviality of the way that the work is generally framed it just becomes so stark because then we, re we realize that some of the preoccupations that are at the top of our list are really <laughs> quite inconsequential you know it's like that's not why we're here there are bigger questions and I love how you reframe the conversation and always bring it back to love because that is the thing that heals us. That is the thing that helps us survive. That is the thing that helps us imagine. That is the thing that helps us hold one another in ways that keep our hearts beating. And yet we're so preoccupied with, you know, getting funding and mainstreaming and da 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 da. But <laughs> what is happening inside our bodies, what is happening inside our souls, what is happening inside our hearts. That's the thing that we should be fighting for, but it gets so lost. I just wanna thank you so much, Seal Power, for, for reminding us of the magnitude of the work that we are called to do and that, that that is what we should be focusing on. Even if we have to navigate the system, we should not allow the system dictate how we do the work, we should navigate the system remembering that there is urgency and that we do not have the time to get sucked into the system thank you so much thank you so much for that yeah like honestly like i totally understand when people especially like activists or queer people who are at the forefront get to a point and they're just like i don't want to be a part of this anymore yeah. i totally i have seen how these uh, movements and uh, this type of organizing how it can swallow people and then spit them out when you are no longer useful i've seen it happen firsthand to people that i that were here and are not here anymore you get and we we go into spaces and we're like what happened to so and so or where did so and so go and these conversations never happen like we never get to the end of it and we wonder how we've created or replicated spaces that continue to harm. So when I hear you speak still, I'm just like, yeah, like I honestly don't even know how we get there, but I, it's, I, it's a place where I want to be, you get, like even if it doesn't happen for me, but then I create a space where the people that come after then are liberated, you get from this, chains that hold us back and we have to continue participating in this in, in Kenya we call it Madogodhan you're like in this mess of a thing you know so yeah uh, I've seen uh, thank you for sharing uh, there's one big concern especially how do we how do we determine what to use the funds for. Often you ask money for wellness and they will never, no one will want to support your wellness. No one will support, will want to support economic empowerment as in economic empowerment for people to, 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 to start up something. They, they, the movement, you will be sucked in this movement used and when you're unable you're forgotten. I've seen so many people forgotten here. I've seen uh, some of our great activists ending up uh, working in uh, McDonald's out of the country. Is that what we want? Is that what we want that every time after after my time in Farouk, 
that I have to go for asylum, I have to seek asylum after my time, that's not what I want. I want to be able to be here, have a place, uh, create um, a place for people to come and, uh, and we chat. We talk about how we used to do whatever. We have a space where young people can, can get some knowledge from this old biggie then, but all that is not provided, you know. You're scared, by the way, it scares me, it worries me. What worries me is when, when I'm done, when I've served, when I've done my part, I need to step back and be able to do things for myself. Will I ever get support? If I am, if, if I am out of Peru and I want to set up, do something for me, will I, it worries me a lot, that worries me. Because um, the dictation of what we use the funds for, vis-a-vis -vis what we need here is a very big problem. It's a very big problem and it leads most of us to asylum, most of activists to asylum, but is that what we want? That's not what we want. We want to be to be able to have our uh, our former directors, our activists then that are somewhere. You can go visit them and have conversations with them. But during my time, that is the only worry I have that what will happen after me. You're given not enough. Most of the money, is, a lot of money is given to the mainstream because of uh, this word that is called uh, lack of capacity. Lack of capacity, everywhere, lack of capacity. You're given less, they have insurance, they have even security because they're working on these serious issues, the LGBT issues. So for them, they're given even, they're given uh, security. When they're coming here, they have double security, insurance is ready. You who is working here, you can't request for money for insurance. You can't have security money there. You must first get an issue for you to have security money on you. Is that fair? And I'm also, I, I keep wondering how to deal with that. I keep wondering on how to deal with that. But the issue of, um, vomiting our, our um, activists is worrying, especially within Africa, it is worrying. It is worrying and how to deal with it, I'm not sure I know, yeah. Thank you so much. That also reminds me of uh, an issue that was coming up in all our conversations. And I remember Olutimeyin when we met in Cape Town to this uh, global LBQ uh, women's conference back then in 2018, right? Um, th that was an issue as well to say like, look, what is our image of an activist? An activist is somebody who's always active, who's always there, who never sleeps, who is, you know, like not a person with, you know, like economic, uh, physical needs, you know, it's uh, somebody who's always in the front line. Um, and that's the type of activism that is seen and that is funded, if it's funded yes. at all. Mm -hmm. um, so that we actually need to radically change our idea of activism. And not only, Absolutely. I mean, like one thing is speaking about self-care, but um, so you, you mentioned accountability as well. So it's yes. both parts to it, right? So self-care as a community but also accountability mm -hmm. from allies, from funders, from, you know, like people that support uh, to actually see the whole person and not, you know, like just uh, the activists on the front line. So I just want to be, be before we start uh, continue talking, I just want to, um, uh, to ask people to actually put comments and questions in the in the Q and A. It's like it's visible for all of you now. I just understood that it wasn't visible for all of you, but now it's visible for all of you. So uh, you can actually really put questions and comments, and we can you know like include them in the in the next uh, fifteen minutes or twenty minutes that we continue. So, Olutimein, do you want to to add? To that I mean I think about I think a lot about the framework that we're operating in and how we can imagine differently and why part of why I stepped away from the idea of activism is this thing that Janita just described um, where you have to enter the system and if you're entering the system it, it follows that eventually you will exit the system and then what does the exit look like? Uh, I, I knew that I didn't want that for myself. And I, I don't know, my imagination is not complete and I, I, don't, um, 
I don't imagine that I, I will ever arrive at the answer on my own. But the thing I always come back to is community. That's the thing I always come back to where when I think about the issues with how funders and donors regulate and constrain and constrict the work that we try to do, uh, how, or the idea of activists burning out and no longer being able to work or or no longer being able to be responsible for everyone else's well-being. The thing that I always come back to is community. How are we in community with one another so that our well-being is always at the forefront? And maybe pivoting away from organizing and activism towards community means that we will have to find whole new ways of doing the work that we do. Maybe it means that we will not be able to sustain our programs and our interventions in the way that we have. But will we come up with other ways that meet those needs that are not dependent on outside forces dictating our strategies or dictating our actions? Will we find ways to nourish and nurture our the ones who have gone before us so that they don't end up living out the rest of their days in penury or having to work low paid jobs to sustain themselves. If we are in community with one another in meaningful ways, can we take care of one another? Can we resource one another? Can we distribute our wealth and our income in ways that allow all more of us to thrive instead of waiting for donors to, you know, like what does it mean if we cannot take care of ourselves unless somebody else is providing for us? What does it mean that we need money? Is money the thing that keeps us alive? Is money the only thing that can keep us alive? If we think about, say, how people survived enslavement in the US and in, on plantations in Brazil, they did not have money. So how did they survive? How did they care for one another under such brutal and dehumanizing circumstances? How were they able to tell stories and, and hold one another and care for one another? What were the resources that they drew on? Because it was not money. So money cannot be the be all and end all of our lives. Money cannot be the thing that determines whether or not we are able to take care of one another. It, there has to be more. And that's why I keep coming back to community. There is something else that becomes possible when we are genuinely in community with one another in ways that are accountable, in ways that are generative, in ways that are committed to a better world. Some, something else will emerge because that's what happens. That, that's what has happened in other contexts where money was not an option. So we first be so dependent on outside forces giving us funding to execute their agendas at the expense of our own lives. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. And so now we have to maybe start asking questions differently in the way CEO Power did, where we have to ask ourselves, have we internalized their objectives or are we still pursuing our own? And are the objectives that we are pursuing sufficient for our well-being and for our healing and for our wholeness? These are the questions that we have to be asking one another so that we are no longer bound to these systems that are so limited and so short-sighted in what they can envision for us and our futures. Shout out. Um, I just wanted to allude to your point, which is very important um, about reimagination of spaces, right? I mean, so for me, like, one thing that I had written this past few days when my mental health was going through the most is that I, I quote, nobody's ever going to care or try to understand me, whether I am too tired or not, and that I am quite aware of that. And in honesty, I'd like to experience what real life as a black, powerful, poor role trans woman looks like where I would not have to feel any forms of violence, where I would not have to be reminded that I am not a woman. Anatomically and authentically speaking, I want to reimagine myself where I am now speaking of life, of healing, of real life freedom. We have not begun having conversations of what real life freedom looks like for us in real time Africa. We only reimagine what that looks like from the perimeters of American, European, UK culture. And I guess we are fighting what, you know, great names like 
Bessie had, like Miriam Makema, like Mama Winnie Madikizela was fighting for, right? And it, it, it's a pity that even still to date, we are still having these conversations. I want to go through an activism where we no longer have these policing moralistic apartheid language like conversation. I want to come into a time where I have decolonial language that speaks as to how we're going to really stop xenophobic, homophobic, transphobic attacks onto those that come to seek a better life in other states of the country, right? I want to start speaking about healing. What does healing look like for me? If healing for me means that I'm constantly reminded that yo, uh -uh, you are not who you say you are, right? By the same people, by turfs. But we have so many turfs amongst us. So many women believe that I'm not supposed to be in this conversation. So many women believe that I'm not supposed to be even uttering anything right now. But I feel like it's a shame because you know, so many of us are committers of crime. We are just sinners, generally speaking. But someone would be so concerned about my gender identity that they forget that yesterday they were sleeping with someone's man or someone's woman. Forgetting that that sin does not make them any different because clearly I'm a sinner, right? So, but anyway, I'm a cute sinner. <laughs> um, so understanding. <laughs> understanding that you know being and identifying within the realms of womanhood and transness is dangerous that it comes at a cost that as a black trans woman as a black woman in africa i continuously experience inequality and this resulting in violence different kinds of violence i've been raped i'm a rape survivor i've been physically violated in 2017 I went to court, my case was thrown out of court because then the doctor went missing. When I further went on to inquire what happened to my case, it was then made to look like I was the perpetrator and not the victim anymore. So that this has somehow impacted my mental health. So like understanding then how do I heal whilst, and how do I begin speaking about systematic language whilst we have not spoken about personal language of healing, of mental health, right? And I think it's important that we start having these conversations by ensuring that when we're going to speak about gender equality or gender equity, we hold those, those are, we hold the perpetrators that are constantly, you know, like pairing us against each other. White monopoly heteronormativity is pairing black people um, against each other. Hence, people don't realize that we are dying one by one. Hence, we are constantly misunderstood. Hence, they're creating so much misunderstanding, so much injustices amongst us. Because white monopoly capital knows that once African people start having a conversation of love and life and what that looks like in real time, then we will not need them anymore. We will not need to be having a conversations of a coalition, a westernized language that seeks to police and erase us. We would begin a reimagination, a language that reimagination, a, re a language that reimagines us in the diaspora, in the utopia, right? Because I mean, I really need to start be having conversations with my Nigerian folk and ask them, what is happening, guys? You know, how much do you need? Why can't funders like trust us with the billions, our billions, let me just say, our billions. I'm just here for the content, guys. So like, when are we going to be given back our reparation? It's called reparation justice. Why are we continuously mimicking and not calling a spade a spade? Are we not activists? You see, this is why sometimes being an activist pisses me off because we mimic whiteness. We gaze into whiteness. We don't dismantle and disrupt whiteness. And those that dismantle and disrupt whiteness are then set to be put on the fence because then they are not African enough or they're not woman enough or they're not activist enough. But when is our activism going to become authentic? When will our activism ever become authentic in a way that I'm able to hold a white person, I'm able to hold Claudia to account to say that Claudia, please bring back my money. You know, when am I going to have that conversation? Why must I be terrified of having such a transparent conversation with someone that is said to be my ally, right? 
why must I be terrified of having a language and a, a past? Like, why am I why am I not allowed to have a language that has been has been passed on to me? Because I'm very aware that my ancestors wanted to have white people, but that they could not be they could not have them because they do not have Zoom. So here I am right now in post COVID democratic Southern Africa, holding whiteness to account. I don't want my child, I don't want another black trans child to be having this conversation with Claudia in the coming 20 years. Instead, I want Claudia's, Claudia's sibling or Claudia to be to give that sibling 20 million and say, do whatever you seek to do with that money. And that should not be questioned. Whatever it's, I, I, I seek to do with that money should be according to my own terms and condition. I am dying every day. I am reminded that every day is a struggle of the fittest. I am reminded that I don't have money for hormones. I am reminded that every every day I could die. And I don't even understand how many parts of me have died for me to even make it to this conversation, for me to even be here. And for how many times must I tell that I'm dying? How many times must I, must I tell you know the, the world, you know, cis people that my tired is tired? Must I write it on the my, my breast? Must I write it on a t-shirt? Just for the world to know that I'm tired. Whiteness has made me tired, guys. I'm tired of whiteness. I'm even tired of blackness. I can't always be around my people and, and feel inferior. And when I'm around white people, I feel inferior. And when I'm around black people, I feel superior. When am I going to feel like a person without, without you know, different kinds of categorizations that we've been categorized, without being reminded that I'm a black trans disempowered poor trans woman? I, I mean, I think I'm at a point where I think I'm no longer going to be speaking about a black American trans woman because they don't speak about me. We always try to speak about them, but they never really recognize us. We try so much to include them in our narratives, but they never include us. Whenever we are included is when we are being asked to be used as a scapegoat for funding and donor. We are never asked, how can I show up for you? It's Understanding that black trans women are different, understanding that black queer people are different. We are fundamentally different. The same way black women are different is the same way white people are different is the same way black trans people are different. And most people have this misconception that we are all the same. Yes, maybe we are the same, but yet we are so different. Because if we would have to use, if we constantly have to like fight for space, but forgetting that we, we, know we, we, are, we live on borrowed time, then the work is not going to be done. You know, and I think this is why the likes of Nina Simone did this work, you know, timelessly, but even further went on to harm themselves along the way because they really believed, they really believed in the black freedom and not black liberation because liberation still holds you to a certain, you know, it still polices you because it's not, it's not free, you're not free, you're just liberated. We, want, we need to start having a conversation of freedom. We have not even begun healing. We've not even begun having self conversations with thyself. What is self forgiveness? What is self healing? What is the self love for me as a black a trans woman? So then when are we going to be having this conversation? Employ people, employ, employ black queer people, employ black trans women, give them jobs. Um, we can't be doing this guys. Um, we can't be doing this. I am really tired, like my mental health. Like I told you two days ago, or just two days ago when I found out that my partner of two years passed on, but they passed on in July. But had I had the money, had I had the capacity, had I had the Wi-Fi, had I was not in a rural area, I would have probably found out that day when he passed on. But because people don't want to understand these disparities, how the system, you know, polices us, even, even even as, as individuals before as a collective, how a white monopolistic, capitalistic, heteronormative, transphobic, patriarchal system continues to police us. And hence we can't be having these conversations. I want to start having radical lifelong conversations. I want to know how am I going to hold Donald Trump to account, but most importantly, how I'm going to hold John, Jonathan Johnson to account, right? I want to be having those conversations as to how am I going to hold Cyril Ramaphosa to account. I can't be speaking about donors that don't care about me. We can't be always using an info gap or an information gap or a baseline um, influenced by white people. We can't always be having white people come into our cities, come into our rural spaces, come into our own private spaces, claiming from us and then leaving us to do their dirty work. We can't be saving them. We can't be saving ourselves because we cannot even save ourselves because we don't have the resources. 
So can someone just please understand that this is coming from a place of love. I'm tired. I keep saying my tired is tired and I cannot stress this any much enough. Tomorrow I could die. Someone right now is dying. I think that we constantly have to re remind ourselves why we do the work because if now we have activists and feminists who feels more important than the other because they're cis women and then because I'm a trans woman and that I'm not supposed to be having this conversation with my comrades, what does it mean? What does it mean for someone in this conversation right now in this Zoom panel discussion feels the need to feels the need that I'm not supposed to be here? What does it mean? Then it means that the work is not being done. Are we doing the work? What does the work look like? What does healing look like? And yet we say that we are healing. What is a safe space when we don't feel safe? Thank you so much, Sir Power. Does anyone want to add something to that? For me, it's really like a very powerful word to the entire panel. I take it to myself, to the organization, to, you know, like the entire context we exist in and work in and are positioned in. Mostly what you said about like having this radical lifelong conversation, it's not something that ends here or, you know, like that we can capture in a one hour Zoom. Maybe we should just take questions from the attendees because we have a lot to, this, this, there's been a lot to think on, um, and it would be nice to hear their voices. Yes. So I think also I have looked in the Q&A, there's a lot of affirmative comments there's a lot to each of you that you can also look at but there's nothing that i would say that we need to discuss here as a further subject or anything without you know like wanting to invisibilize the those people who joined us were also all all from like queer feminist contexts and communities but i would just like leave it at this and um you know we can look at those um and get in contact directly so i really want to thank you for creating this wonderful space i want to thank you seal power olotime and yvonne and also you janita for holding this space for creating this space for your insights uh, for your inspirations also for the amazing work you do um for the in for the power for the inspiration you throw into the zoom you throw out into the world you throw out to into communities but you know like also beyond those so it is really really great honor for me to have you all of you here and i really hope we continue this conversation as you said it's a radical lifelong conversation it's not something that ends here and i also want to thank uh, as i said the invisible public Uh, who joined us today, uh, who also contributed with comments in the Q&A section. Um, I also want to thank my invisible team for putting all of this together. Um, and uh, just for all of those who see this Zoom, to remind you, during the next two weeks, this Zoom will be made public uh, on YouTube and our social media channels. So we will have a chance to really share this widely with our communities, with friends, with colleagues, and with everyone who also we think is supposed to see that, not only wants to, but is should see that and should hear that. Um, and there's also going to be all those conversations we've had, uh, each one of you with me, as in form of written interviews that's going to be published in English and German on our website. So um, to all of those who have registered for today's Zoom, I will send the link via email. And uh, yes, please share widely and check out the website also for other you know, projects, for other materials, also from our offices in Cape Town, Dakar, Abuja, and Nairobi, if you're interested in further work. So I'm very, very thankful. I'm very, very honored. Um, yeah, and I... I'm really happy to that we had this conversation today. And with this, I want to thank the public as well. Yeah, there's a lot of comments saying thanks. 
powerful panel power to you thanks for sharing the truth so yeah that's a that's a lot of energy in that as well yeah give thanks so we're gonna end the recording here we say bye bye to all those people who just watch it and we're gonna stay in and end this this discussion amongst us Thank you, guys. <laughs>